Uh, the cool thing about mm -hmm. mindsets is that they're not a direct reflection of reality as it is. Uh, they're an interpretation of reality. And because they're an interpretation, that means that we have a choice, right? We have room to change and alter uh, the way we think about something. Welcome to Boom. We have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Welcome to our wellness series. In these three episodes, we approach wellness through understanding movement, sleep, and mindset. We get a firsthand look at the latest research from professors at Stanford on these topics, and we're excited to share some tips on how you can improve your wellness and health without feeling overwhelmed. This is our third and final episode of our wellness series featuring Professor uh, Aliyah Crum at Stanford. In this episode, we learn about what mindsets are, why they're so important, and how we can leverage our mindsets deliberately to improve our health and well-being. And at the end of the episode, we'll share how you can win a copy of the book, A Path with Heart by Jack Kornfield. So on this episode of our wellness series, we are really excited to be talking with Dr. Aliyah Crum, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Stanford University and the Principal Investigator of the Stanford Mind and Body Lab. Her research focuses on mindsets, how they affect important outcomes and domains such as exercise, stress, and diet, and how they can be consciously and deliberately changed through intervention to increase psychological well-being. I've had the pleasure of having Aaliyah as an advisor throughout my PhD, and so I'm extremely excited to share some of the things I've learned from you with our listeners today. Awesome. So excited to be here. <laughs> and Aaliyah, before we get into some of your current research, we're, we want to go back to the beginning. So when did you first know you wanted to study psychology and what drew you to the field? I think if you look back, I could see signs, signs coming from, you know, way back in childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up in a very interesting home environment. Uh, my mm. father was a teacher of meditation and a master of the art of Aikido. And he and my mom started a martial art academy that sort of transformed itself into a place where people would go and study mind body arts. Uh, uh, so people from all over the world would come to meditate and uh, meet with, you know, world renowned uh, practitioners and thought leaders like Ram Das or psychologist Virginia Satir. Wow. And so I grew up in this environment kind of, you know, just assuming that was that that, normal. Yeah, that, that was normal. <laughs> about how you know your philosophies of mind influence your physiological state uh that was my upbringing i got to um i was also an athlete growing up so i think i was consciously and constantly aware of the role of you know our mind in our physical performance uh, but when mm -hmm. i got to harvard as an undergraduate i realized two things one was that that was not a normal upbringing <laughs> that was pretty unique <laughs> Uh, but two is actually that people were even at, you know, places like Harvard starting to explore these things and to study scientifically uh, things like mindfulness, things like meditation, things like the placebo effect, all of which are examples of how our minds can influence our bodies and our well-being and our performance. So I remember going through the course catalog, um, which, you know, this is dating myself, but at the time it was like a physical book and circling all the <laughs> classes that I was interested in and like 95% of them were in psychology. So that's when it was, <laughs> that's when the deal Apparent. was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very clear. It's nice when, yeah, the choice becomes so, uh, so clear like that. <laughs> it's so, it's funny too, to, yeah, think about our upbringing and growing up, but always, you know, you never know what's not normal until you step out of, um, of, of your, what you're used to. Um, yeah. And I know Melissa, you were a gymnast as well. So you also, maybe, you know, you took the, the route of studying the body. <laughs> you're coming back now into the mind. But, you know, as an yes. athlete, these things are really in your face, you know, how important they are. Yeah, absolutely. Especially I remember at gymnastics, we would always, before we would do our routines, we would always visualize it. And um, I mean, I think a lot of the, the struggle and challenge with gymnastics is oftentimes more mental than um, physical. So um, 
definitely came into play and in realizing that more as I'm learning more about psychology. Um, and mindsets in particular, I think it's becoming a term that's um, much more um, common um, than it than it used to be. And I think it's, it's probably a term that many people have heard before, but um, I really learned from you just really the, the nuance of sort of the mainstream definitions that we've been hearing. And so we're wondering if we could start out with your definition of mindset. Great. Yeah, a lot of people use the term just to sort of say a state of mind. You know, I was in the right mindset, mm. or I was in the wrong mindset, or I was in a positive mindset. Uh, the way we define mindset is uh, a core assumption about a domain or category that orients us to a particular set of associations, uh, expectations, and goals. And this work on mindset was really inspired by Carol Dweck's research on mindset. And she mm. looked at a particular type of mindset. It was a mindset about the domain of intelligence or ability, broadly speaking. And she kind of crafted or started to understand uh, two different mindsets that one might have about one's intelligence or abilities. Uh, one mindset is that abilities and intelligence are fixed, that they're you know stable and kind of set. <laughs> or another mindset is that you know, your intelligence is malleable, your abilities are malleable, they can grow and change with time. Um, mm -hmm. So that, you know, I, I became really interested in her work and the power in which just, you know, one or the other of those mindsets could have on our motivation, on our persistence after failure, and on ultimately our performance, our academic and other performance. Mm -hmm. And what we started to realize was that, you know, that was just one mindset of many mm -hmm. mindsets, you know, every single domain or category, there's a potential for us to have a mindset about it. Uh, so for example, we started to do some research in the domain of stress. What are people's core assumptions about the nature of stress? And what we found is that by and large, people have the mindset, the sort of core assumption that stress is debilitating, that it's bad, that it's mm. going to harm your performance, productivity, health, well-being. But what we realized is that that wasn't, you know, that mindset wasn't inevitable. It didn't have to be that way. And if you actually look at the research on stress, you realize that a whole other mindset is possible. And that is the mindset that stress can be enhancing, that the experience of stress mm. can help you to, uh, you know, can actually amp up your cognitive and physiological functioning in such a way that not only help you meet the demands you're faced with, but also help you sort of permanently grow to exist at a higher level, a new level. So what does that mean? What mindsets are, you know, it's not that, you know, one or the other viewpoint is necessarily true or false, right or wrong, but they're different interpretations. They're simplified assumptions that we make about an inherently complex reality. But what's interesting about mindsets is that the mindsets that we choose or the mindsets that we end up holding given our developmental sort of upbringing and the cultures we live in uh, have an important effect on the ways in which we live and ultimately right. on our health and well-being. Wow. Wow. That's a great definition and so holistic and um you know, before Melissa started in your lab, I didn't even know what the word mindset was, you know, other than colloquially. So thank you for that really thorough definition. I know our listeners will appreciate that. Um, and I think similarly in the colloquial sense, when I, when I think about mindsets, um, I think of how it affects our thoughts, you know, our thought patterns, how we're thinking. But what other ways, you just listed some ways, but can you just elaborate on how mindsets like I'm sure there's complex interactions with all those different variables you just talked about. So can you just elaborate more on that? Great. Yeah. So, so again, you can have a core assumption about a domain or category. So let's mm -hmm. think about another mindset that we've done some research on, and that's mindsets about healthy eating. Um, so mm -hmm. what we've looked at there is this mindset that, you know, broadly speaking, many people in America you know, at least in Western cultures, tend to view healthy eating as essentially disgusting and depriving. <laughs> now, that's sort of a core <laughs> assumption that you might make sure. about healthy eating. Uh, but for that, that core assumption becomes impactful for, first by changing the way we think, right? So mm. as I mentioned, it shapes our uh, uh, associations or attributions, basically your explanations for things. 
uh, shapes your expectations for what's going to happen and it can shape your goals. So in the case of mindsets mm -hmm. about healthy eating, that might lead you to, you know, if you eat uh, some broccoli and you don't like the taste, you might say, well, of course I didn't like the taste. It's healthy. It's good for me. Why would I expect <laughs> it to taste you know, your, your explanations yeah. for how things are change depending on that mindset. It also shapes your expectations, your expectations about what's going to happen in the future. So, you know, if you believe that, you know, healthy foods are essentially disgusting and depriving, you might expect that that broccoli that's about to be served is not going to be <laughs> very tasty, right? Oh. And then, of course, it changes your goals. You might, mm -hmm. you know, not want to eat that broccoli, or maybe your goal would be, well, I have to endure eating that broccoli because I want to maintain, you know, some sort of diet plan that I'm on, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see how the core assumption colors and changes how we think it changes how we explain things it changes what we expect and it changes what our goals are but it doesn't stop there right mindsets then change how we interact with the world right so first they can change our attention what we pay attention to so you might notice certain attributes of that broccoli versus others. It also changes what we actually do, right? So we might tend to avoid trying other kinds of, you know, different preparations of broccoli or different, you know, varieties of healthy foods, right? So it changes the way we attend and engage with the world. But it doesn't stop there. Mindsets might also change how we feel, right? So, you know, if you feel like healthy foods are just disgusting and depriving and you're forced to go on a diet, you might just feel miserable about being on that diet, right? And then lastly, right. mindsets can change our physiology, right? So in other words, they change what our bodies prioritize and prepare to do. And we've shown in some of our research that if you're in the mindset that what you're eating is healthy, your body can respond as if it didn't eat as much as you actually did. My <laughs> headphones just fell off. <laughs> it, are you guys hearing feedback when I like move it? Because it's no. Okay. The biomechanics of my headphones are not <laughs> ideal. I need some help with them. Um, so, it, so we've shown in in one study, for example, we gave people the exact same milkshake but we told them it was either an indulgent sort of high fat, high calorie milkshake, or we told them it was a healthy, low fat, low calorie milkshake. And we were measuring their body's ghrelin levels uh, in response. So ghrelin is essentially, you know, medical experts call it the hunger hormone. And, you know, nutritionists assume that ghrelin levels go up, you know, in anticipation of eating, and then they decline uh, theoretically in response to how many calories you eat. So if you ate a large meal, mm -hmm. your ghrelin levels will drop more than if you ate, uh, you know, a smaller meal. What we found in this study was that ghrelin levels, the drop in ghrelin after drinking this milkshake differed depending on what people thought about the milkshake. So if they thought they were eating this healthy milkshake, uh, their ghrelin levels remained high, but if they thought it was indulgent, even though it was the same exact shake, their ghrelin levels dropped at a threefold rate uh, higher than um, mm. or more than when they thought it was healthy. So, yeah, you can start to see how this mindset that, for example, healthy foods are disgusting and depriving colors the way we think, it colors the way we act, it can color the way we feel, and it can even change and alter the way our bodies respond to these things. And through those mechanisms, you know, it can fundamentally change how we experience life. Yeah, it's yeah. so I love that you bring up that study. It's one of the studies that I love to share with people. Um, and, and often I think the response is, oh, so we should just tell ourselves that the milkshake so we're eating that we're, you know, having our healthy and then like, we won't gain weight or, you know, it's like, it's definitely <laughs> not that simple. I'm so curious um, if, if anyone's ever uh, brought that up and like the types of um, responses that you kind of get to um, sort of combat the those types of, of questions of, yeah, is it as simple as just then thinking differently or, you know, wishing that something would be healthy or not healthy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this study, you know, we thought about it just because I had done a lot of research on placebo effects, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, and read a lot of research showing that, you know, 
the, the mere expectation or belief that you're taking a real medication can produce physiological responses in the body, even if there's no active ingredients in the, in the pill. Mm. And we wanted to sort of just see like, you know, does that idea extend to other domains, other domains like exercise or diet? And so we were purely just interested in if our bodies differed depending on the mindset we we're in. And to be honest with you, I actually assumed that the better mindset to have would be the mindset that you're eating healthily, right? I just thought mm. that like, mm. oh, you know, that makes sense. It's sort of like a placebo, like you feel like you're eating healthy and you'll have a healthy response. And what mm-hmm. we found was it was not that simple. And in fact, it was the exact opposite of that because the mindset wasn't sort of this vague sort of positive healthiness. It was the underlying assumption of what healthiness meant. And mm-hmm. as we found out, this assumption of healthiness was related to deprivation, the, the sense of not getting enough. And that, I think it was that mindset that led physiology physiologically to have the body respond as if it didn't get enough, right? So the hunger mm-hmm. hormone signals remained high. And so we learned something really important, you know, beyond just the simple fact that our bodies aren't just responsive to the objective nature of what we eat, but also to our mindsets and interpretations of what we eat. But also (laughs) that if you want to maintain or lose weight, in fact, the best mindset to be in is one that you're eating indulgently, right? Now, Mm. to your point, that was revolutionary, right? Because I, you know, having been an athlete and a gymnast, and I'd always been trying to like, you know, maintain my weight and I'd worry, you know, I'd want to be on diets and I'd want to eat sensibly. And I realized that I had gone about it all wrong, right? I was constantly in this Mm -hmm. mindset of like, oh, I'm eating healthy. I'm eating a salad. I'm eating, you know, (laughs) and yeah, it was like you're depriving yourself of. Yeah, that that might be counteracting my hard work at dieting. Now, to your point, though, when we talk about mindsets, that does not mean that mindset is everything, right? It doesn't mean that there's no objective ingredients in the shake and it doesn't matter whether you're eating a milkshake or a broccoli. Like there are objective ingredients in foods and those things matter. But so too does our mindset. So the ultimate, you know, I think what I tried to strive for in my own life is to eat you know, healthy foods, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But eat them in a mindset of indulgence. Like how can I actually prepare Mm -hmm. vegetables and broccoli in ways that make them taste amazing and make them feel indulgent? That's really the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. I think it takes, it it makes it um, much more, I don't know, tangible or, or, or much deeper than just what you're thinking, you know, really creating it. And and I think this kind of leads to something that you talk about mindsets and that, and that they're self-fulfilling. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if we could maybe take a step back before that in terms of how we, when you're talking about the underlying assumptions of that we have about health or about stress, um, where do we get these underlying assumptions from? <laughs> um, and then maybe you can also talk to the to the self-fulfilling nature of mindsets. Yeah. So, and also I want to underscore a a point that you made, which is, I think really important, which is that I, I think when it comes to aspects of the mind, by and large, we've taken this very sort of unsophisticated view on it. It's like, Oh, Mm. it's just a positive Mm. mindset or a negative mindset as a healthy mindset or an unhealthy mindset. And, oh, it's like either in your head or not in your head. And the reality is Mm. it's a far more complex, nuanced and sophisticated thing that we're dealing with, the ways in which our minds can influence our body. A, it's not all or nothing. It's always a dynamic blend of what we think and what we're actually doing. And B, uh, the aspects of our mind are very nuanced. It's not just that you're in a positive mindset or a negative mindset, a healthy mindset or an unhealthy mindset. It's, you know, the mindset is this food or the domain or class of healthy foods can be tasty and indulgent, right? That has Mm -hmm. a powerful effect. Or when it comes to stress mindsets, you know, and this, it becomes really important there because we're not saying that the stressor 
you know, experiencing a cancer diagnosis or, you know, a trauma in your life, like is a positive thing. And you should just think positively. That's not the useful mindset. The useful mindset right. is, a, you know, is viewing the nature of stress as something going through that as something that can lead to enhancing outcomes. So there are mm-hmm. subtle, nuanced, sophisticated differences in the, what actually the mindset is. Uh, that are important and (laughs) we need to do a lot more work to kind of really pinpoint those rather than just sort of being hand wavy. Oh, your mindset matters. Oh, think positively. Um, Mm. That, that, that doesn't get us to where I think we want to be, which is a more complex and nuanced and sophisticated understanding. Um, So where do these mindsets come from? (laughs) Uh, We, we sort of, you know, I sort of group it into sort of three classes or, you know, sources of mindset. The first is the culture that you live in. So we live in cultures in which institutions and ideas abound about things and those institutions and ideas influence the way we think. Uh, As we talked about in our culture, if you think about this mindset about healthy foods, you know, where did that come from? Well, in part, it's come from the billions of dollars that have been spent teaching people that what's actually tasty and indulgent are these sort of fast foods, sugary sodas, high calorie, high processed (laughs) foods, right? There's literally billions of dollars spent on advertising, marketing those as what's fun for you, what'll make you happy, what'll make you cool, what will mm-hmm. taste good, <laughs> what will make you sexy, so to speak. And so, yes. you know, by contrast, we start to assume, well, if those are the tasty and exciting and delicious and indulgent foods, then these other, you know, you know, uh, healthy foods, so to speak, are going to be less tasty and indulgent by contrast. Mm. So this comes from the cultures that we live in and that, that, um, is it the case in all cultures? You know, if you go to uh, France, for example, a lot of European cultures have a very different take on, uh, you know, healthy foods and what to expect along those lines. Um, mm-hmm. So culture is, is one source, and obviously there's a multifaceted, <laughs> facets, multiple facets of culture, which we can unpack. Another source um, is your development. Uh, so mm-hmm. how you were raised, how your parents talk to you about, you know, the nature of stress or the domain of healthy foods or the nature of intelligence Mm -hmm. or, you know, other domains. Mm -hmm. Uh, And third, there's the role of influential others. So people who we view as, you know, competent and warm in a domain of interest, we listen to about what they say. So when it comes to you know, um, you know, mindsets about health, for example, or our bodies, we really turn to doctors and what they might say about, mm. you know, a certain illness or, or stress, for example, might influence our mindset. You know, with healthy foods, we might turn, yeah, to our mothers to see what they say or to, you know, a nutritionist and how they talk about healthy foods. So uh, culture, development, social influence. And then I guess there really is a fourth, a fourth source of mindset, and that is our conscious choice. Uh, the cool thing mm-hmm. about mindsets mm-hmm. is that they're not a direct reflection of reality as it is. Uh, they're an interpretation <laughs> of reality. And because they are an interpretation, that means that we have a choice, right? We have room to change and alter uh, the way we think about something. Uh, especially things that are complex and nuanced, like the nature of stress, which is multifaceted, we can choose to view the debilitating aspects, or we could choose to view the enhancing aspects. And uh, Mm -hmm. we have power and agency in that, which is is pretty exciting. Uh, So um, I'm I'm talking a lot here, should I stop? And (laughs) (laughs) you guys want to say something, I get on a roll. Well, it's great. I mean, it'd be kind of sad if there was a really short, easy answer to where mindsets come from. So I'm glad that you gave us the full picture. (laughs) Um, So thank you for that. And I want to pause. I think it's really um, nice that you've highlighted all these different influences, um, and especially this last one on, um, you know, there's this empowering notion that we can change, that 
we aren't, you know, we aren't fixed and we have some control over that and it's conscious control. And so I'm wondering what are the ways that we can either in that vein work on our mindset or maybe in the, you know, kind of in the other um, influencing domains, can, what are strategies to change our mindset or, or just work on it, improve it um, that you found? Yeah, it's such an important question. I, I think the first step is to recognize that we have mindsets, you know, like I said, mm -hmm. that, you know, the mindset that stress is debilitating isn't a, you know, isn't inevitable. We don't have to have that. Um, mm -hmm. There's no sort of mm -hmm. objective truth that we're just reflecting in the way we think. And once you recognize that you have mindsets about certain things, you can start to ask yourself, well, what's the impact of this mindset? And you can kind of go through this process of, you know, playing out, you know, through those mechanisms that I talked about, how it affects your attention, your your emotions, your behavior, and your physiology. Well, if you have the mindset that stress is debilitating, how is that going to make you feel, right? It's going to make you mm -hmm. feel more stressed when you're stressed. <laughs> you're basically adding <laughs> on stress to stress. Uh, how does it change your attention well some you know you often get like overly focused on the stress and freaked out about the stress you might mm. over engage um you know and what we've seen in our research is that people actually go one of two routes they either you know freak out and become overly obsessed with dealing with this stress or they check out and they're like well i can't deal with this because it's going to be debilitating so they kind of you know over under react to things um, and then physiologically, we've seen changes as well. Um, and, you know, so you might start to realize, wow, you know, having that mindset, it's not necessarily wrong. I mean, there, there's truth to that, but the mindset is not helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So what could be a more useful mindset? What if I could focus on the nature of stress as enhancing? And that doesn't mean that you have to view, again, the stressor as a good thing, but you know, the, the experience of going through a global pandemic, for example, or a cancer diagnosis or a trauma, or even just sitting in traffic, right? How could you start to view the experience of that as mm. enhancing? And once you mm. start to really get connected with how that could be a more useful mindset to be in, I think there's more uh, freedom and motivation to, to shift into that mindset. Mm. And Melissa, back to what you said, uh, yeah, I mean, the power of these mindsets is that even though they're not a reflection of reality as it is, they, they <laughs> through these mechanisms and changing how we connect with and respond and view and pay attention and feel, they can create that reality, right? So if you view stress as enhancing, and we've shown in our research, people engage with stress in a way that actually makes it more likely that enhancing outcomes occur, that you do rise to the mm. occasion, you perform well, you grow, you can even become more physiologically kind of tougher in response mm. to that stress. So recognizing that your mindsets matter, thinking about the impact they have, and then choosing the mindset that you think is most adaptive. Thank you for, yeah, those are very nice, like, I think, graspable um, tips and um, it's, it's a logical flow of how that works. But I think, I just think of myself sometimes in the moment, if I'm stressed, it's hard to recognize what kind of mindset I'm having. So I'm just wondering, going very, back to that very first step, do you have any tips or just specific ways to sort of figure out what your mindsets are? Like, how do you kind of check in on where you are? How do you get that awareness that you're talking about? Yeah, and we, we've actually, so with the stress mindset, uh, for example, we have created this three-step approach to adopting a stress is enhancing mindset. And I can also, I don't know if you guys can include a link, but we have a toolkit on our website that people can go and kind of go through yes, this intervention we can do to that. help we them. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And again, this is a place where like, periodically, you know, I, I did this work, I started this work when I was doing my uh, dissertation. And, you know, it's, it's always funny to do research on stress when you're doing your dissertation, because you're constantly stressed. <laughs> <laughs> but still,
still to this day, you know, my husband's like, uh, you might want to check in on your mindset about stress. <laughs> about stress. Uh, it often takes loved ones to kind of point out, uh, you know, yeah, um, being yeah. uh, hypocritical. But yeah, so how do you how do you actually change your mindset in the moment? We we offer you know two strategies that I think are important. One mm-hmm. is to identify an anchor in your life. Um, that's something that mm-hmm. is uh, regular uh, that you see on a daily basis that is meaningful, or you can at least make meaningful by relabeling it as a trigger to kind of clue into your Mm -hmm. mindset and go through these three steps. So, you know, for me, I often use uh, doorknobs and doors as an anchor. So it's like when I open my door into my office, for an example, that's an opportunity to kind of check in and say, okay, am I stressed? What is my mindset? You know, being aware of that, you know, in in our stress Mm -hmm. mindset approach, the three steps are to acknowledge your stress, to welcome it, and to utilize your stress. And so I'll Mm. use those sort of doorknobs as a reminder to kind of go through that three-step process. You can do it pretty quickly, actually. Um, The other kind of anchor I'll use or suggest that people use is picking a stress signal. So this is something for you that marks that point, which I call sort of a tipping point of self-destruction, you know, when you get to that point of stress where you're like, okay, like (laughs) this is going downhill. (laughs) Um, And noticing what that is for you. Like it might be you all of a sudden get really tired or maybe your heart starts racing Mm -hmm. or maybe you start snapping at people or maybe you get, you know, really kind of cynical about things. You know, for me, it's, I get really kind of short with people And so when I notice myself doing Mm -hmm. that, I can now use that, I can label that as a reminder to go through these three steps, right? Or more simply to sort of just check in on my mindset and see if it's worth shifting it. So it's a daily anchor and a stress signal, uh, labeling those two things in your life as opportunities to check in on your mindset and to uh, think about, you know, how you can get into an adaptive mindset. I really Does like that, that especially, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's having, I like both of those. I like the idea of having an anchor to remind you, but then also taking a stress signal, which I think sometimes we can kind of beat ourselves up about. I know sometimes I get, you know, frustrated in the ways that I show stress um, and, you know, wish I didn't do that. But I think your reframe of being like, okay, actually, this is an opportunity to check in um, and sort of evaluate, you know, what's going on. And um, how can I, you know, I'm noticing that I'm stressed and how can I use this to um, more constructively? Um, I think that's a really fantastic uh, reframing of stress signals. Yeah. And again, Uh, the first step is always just to notice right? Just to Mm -hmm. notice that you have mindsets, notice that you're stressed. Just again, you know, mind being mindful and non-judgmental about this is really the first step. And once you see that and you're, you know, you're not hard on yourself about it, even if you're in a, you know, (laughs) an unhelpful place, that Mm -hmm. gives you the freedom to then say, okay, like, all right, this is how I am. This is how I'm feeling. This is where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Mm. and that's okay right now should I choose uh, a different mindset or a different approach what would that be right so it's Mm. really you can't you can't it's never helpful to just say oh I need to change this right away you first have to honor where you are you have to acknowledge the mindsets that you're in acknowledge the sources of those mindsets it's not our fault that we're in a stress is debilitating mindset constantly Mm. in this culture because we've been bombarded by messages all our lives telling us that stress is bad for us. So it's not, we shouldn't beat ourselves up when we find ourselves in that position. Yeah, that makes sense. And that seems like maybe one of the challenging parts of trying to cultivate what might be a more helpful or beneficial mindset. Are there any other um, points in that process that you know of that tend to be more challenging to 
for people to change their mindset? And um, are there strategies for sort of overcoming some of the most common um, barriers? Yeah, it's a really good, good question. I think probably the most common barriers are doubt that the other mindset is mm. true. Um, mm. For example, you know, it might be like, well, how could stress really be enhancing? Everything I read tells me it's bad for me, right? Or, you know, healthy foods. Well, they, you know, there's no way they could be taste indulgent. That's just not possible. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or can't, you know, I haven't talked a lot about our illness mindset work, but, you know, one of the uh, mindsets that Sean Zeon and our lab has been looking at it, mindsets about illness. Do you view cancer, for example, as a catastrophe uh, or mm. something that could be an opportunity? And it might be like, well, of course it's not an opportunity. There's nothing opportunistic mm. about it. You know, so I think there's, there's resistance to the whether this alternative mindset is true or not. And I think what I would say there mm. is that you need to, um, again, stop focusing on the what is now and focus on what could be in the future and how your choices mm. around your mindset now might influence and change what is possible in the future. So instead of forcing you to believe, oh, yes, 100% healthy foods are tasty and indulgent, it's just adopting the mindset that healthy foods could be, could possibly be, could potentially mm. be tasty. And kind of just like open up to that a little bit and then see, <laughs> just explore, just be scientists and observe how that mindset mm. changes reality. Mm. So it's Again, first, reduce the judgment on yourself for the mindset that you're in. <laughs> Second, reduce the sort of judgment about what's possible and being open and, and adopt a stance of openness around that. I love that baby step. <laughs> <laughs> baby steps, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, this has just been so incredible, and I feel like we could talk forever about mindsets. Um, but I think we have just a couple more questions that we'd like to ask. But, but first... Um, how can people learn more about you and your work? Um, yeah, and I was just along. feeling, I know you have a lot of, you know, grad students and academics who listen, and I haven't really talked about the nuts and bolts of the studies, so I encourage people to go <laughs> on our website. Uh, it's mbl.stanford.edu, and you can see our publications there. And we also have a tab that le links to interventions and toolkits, which are, you know, really useful kind of, uh, it, it, you know, materials that can help you to change your mindsets about stress or to help, mm. you know, change how you talk to your kids about stress or, or healthy foods. So our website's a good hub for all that. Awesome. Yeah. And we've talked a lot at a pretty high level about mindsets today, but I think um, that will be really helpful for people because there is so much research behind everything that you've shared with us today. So that will be really exciting. Um, and now I'd like to turn it to you and ask, what are you most excited for, for the future of mindset research? Uh, I'm really, I'm most excited for uh, people like you and Melissa, you know, people who have come from other fields, you know, studying things like biomechanics. It's like, how much more physical can you get? And then <laughs> you realize in going through that, that you can't really have a full appreciation of one's physical functioning without an adequate understanding of the mind. And to me, that's really exciting. It's really exciting to see, you know, when I, when I started as an assistant professor at Stanford and I wanted to do more work in the medical setting, I thought I'd have to go and like convince people that this mattered. <laughs> and mm -hmm. what I've learned is that, you know, the more people I talk to, doctors and, you know, nurses and, you know, orthopedic surgeons, like, if you actually talk to them, they they are, will all say, wow, I get it. Like, this is so, I know that psychology matters here. Mm. But then they don't, they can't get to the next step because we haven't done nearly the amount of research we need to do. We haven't devoted nearly the amount of attention that, you know, aspects of our psychology and how it changes our health deserves. We are really at the tip of the iceberg of this understanding, and there's so mm -hmm. much more <laughs> to be mm -hmm. done. Um, you know, it's uh, 
you know, I, I think I'll use, you know, the recent events of Simone Biles and the Olympics. I think it's great that, you know, this is an example of how we need to pay more attention to mental health. And that's wonderful. What's troubling to me about it is how, if it were a physical injury, we would know exactly what it was and, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what the mechanics mm -hmm. of the injury were and how to prevent it and how to cure it. But when yeah. it's, how long know, it would take to recover. recover. <laughs> exactly. But if it's a mental mm. health issue, it's mm. this very vague, very obscure, uh, not precise at all kind of yeah. label. Right. And mm. I, I'm excited about putting more precision and more sophistication and more nuance to that label uh, of mindset of mental health and how it affects our health and performance. Yeah, I, we are so excited for that too. And I think I'm so excited for the advances that, that you're making in, in doing that and then being able to, you know, because like you said, you can't really truly understand the full extent of like physical functioning without the mental part too. And so it's so crucial to then, you know, be able to take what you're learning and be able to translate that to different fields. And um, I think as we've been talking a lot about noticing our own mindsets, I think something I also want to just mention is that, you know, we also are influencing other people's mindsets. And so um, a lot of us work with people, um, whether we're working with patients or we're working with, um, you know, people that we're mentoring or just our friends and family, you know, just being cognizant too about the ways that we might be influencing other people's mindsets. Mm -hmm. um, although I, you know, I think as, as, you're saying as the research is progressing, I think there'll be more um, specific ways and knowing how to change mindsets deliberately. Um, but you know, often we're we're changing mindsets not intentionally um, too. Yeah, it's such a good point. And you know, being a new parent, I have a three-year-old. It's oh. becoming increasingly <laughs> clear. You know, <laughs> think about how I am as a parent, how the things I'm doing are not just sort of changing her behavior, but really ultimately shaping her mindsets. And arguably that is the most important thing <laughs> to focus on because those mindsets will color and influence how she goes about her whole life. Uh, so yeah, as parents, as teachers, as mentors, as doctors, as friends, uh, we have a responsibility in in terms of you know how we're influencing others' mindsets, and there's a lot more work we can do along those those lines as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ali. This has been uh, fantastic uh, to learn from you, and I'm so excited for other people to hear this. I think it's going to be really mm -hmm. exciting and inspiring to other people. So we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Yes, I feel like my course. mindset and has shifted today. <laughs> oh, good. <I'm> <laughs> and Melissa, next time we, you should uh, maybe eventually in the future, you can share more about your exciting studies. Yes, yes, I uh, will definitely have to do that. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. We hope your mindset about mindsets grew as ours did in this episode. Aliyah gave us some great insight on the benefits of shaping your mindset and ways to check in on it throughout the day. For example, she used doorknobs as her daily anchor to check in with herself. Yes, so we want to encourage you to find your own daily anchors to check in with yourself. Um, and when you do, you can let us know either on Twitter or Instagram with a post or on your story, making sure to tag us. You can share your daily anchor. You can share what you learned from this episode or any other takeaways or things you want to implement into your life to help shift your mindset to something that's more adaptive and healthy. Um, so 12 people will be rewarded with a copy of A Path with Heart by Jack Cornfield. We hope that you learned a little bit about wellness today and that you feel empowered to help yourself and others to live better. We'd like to thank the International Society of Biomechanics, the Stanford Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab, the Catalyst Project on Motivating Mobility, and you can learn more about that project at motivatingmobility.stanford.edu. We'd also like to thank Wellbeing at Stanford, Stanford Recreation and Wellness, all for supporting Boom, as well as Peter Washington for creating the music you hear. Thank you for listening, and you can follow Boom at Biomechanics OOM on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
And you can email us at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail.com. If you have ideas for new episodes, if you have feedback on this episode, or you just want to be friends, we are open to anything. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. And biomechanics off our minds. minds.